you're tuning in, you're tuning into the Born Into Mining panel. I'll be your, your host today. My name is Matthew Mickleborough. I host the JRI Junior Resource Investing podcast and newsletter. Uh, just so we're all aware, just some typical housekeeping items. Uh, there will be a question and answer period at the end of this. So please, if you have any questions, enter them into the chat and I'll do my best. You know, I'll do my level best to get them in, you know, uh, kind of time, time, uh, time permitting, so to speak. Otherwise, this is being recorded. Okay, so if you're in this room, please be aware that yet you kind of consent to being recorded. Uh, and otherwise, all standard disclaimers apply. All right, blue sky conversations potentially, not financial advice, et cetera, et cetera. And I see where our numbers are just starting to tick up here. So I'll do the first one again here just so we can get that off so that people can hear. I do encourage a q and I do encourage uh, listener questions. Uh, if you can, I'll do my best to get them in. Otherwise, I'm excited. This is going to be an interesting one. It's uh, probably more of a, 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 a reflective topic versus your more sort of typical company promo. And I, I, I'm excited because these are two fairly honest and articulate gentlemen here are joining me. Two Yukon boys, they're going to reflect on what it's like growing up in a mining family in Yukon and hopefully share some anecdotes and insights into those personal histories. We've got uh, two Kitco Mining Seal of the Year nominees here. We got Brandon McDonald, who is the nominee, and uh, Scott Birdall of, of uh, oh, Brandon McDonald, pardon me, of Fire Reed Metals. Scott Birdall of, of uh, Snowline Gold, who is the winner. So, Brandon, if you've got any grievances you have to settle with that one, I'll ask you to keep that for the parking lot after we're done here today. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, gentlemen, thanks for joining me today. How are you guys doing? They're doing well. Yeah, pretty good here. Yeah, good. Uh, so, yeah, like I say, we're going to just delve into your personal histories and just how do you think that impacts your own career and your own past, present, and future in this industry. Uh, I mean, so, yeah, no place to start like the beginning. And, Brandon, I'll, I'll ask this question to both of you guys, and both of you will have an opportunity to ask these questions. I'll, I'll rotate back and forth. But, Brandon, I'll start with you. Do you just want to maybe establish your family connection for us? I mean, what were your, you know, your father's, parents, extended family's industry jobs that made it have a sort of familial personal connection for you from the get-go? Yeah, interestingly, my my father was the first in the family to get involved in mining and specifically exploration. Um, and as a bit of an accident, he um, was studying commerce at SFU and um, got a summer job managing a lab uh, in Whitehorse. And that led to the next summer, which led to, um, you know, subsequent uh years and then and then actually moving up there and getting into expediting and an exploration um that's how he he met my mother up there uh, who was also a bit of a transplant to yukon and uh you know they created that business uh, the expediting and exploration business that that uh you know brought our family from whitehorse to ross river awesome and scott over to you um yeah no it's, i think it's funny how uh, there's so many kind of small world things that happen in Yukon, maybe just small territory and, and therefore more likely. But um, with with Brandon's project at McMillan Pass there, uh, you know, starting at the very beginning, uh, my parents actually met at McMillan Pass. So um, so I owe a lot to uh, to mining and exploration and uh, to, you know, to fireweed, to, to the Tom and Jason uh, and, uh, and Mac Tongue anyway. Um, and uh, yeah, my father, uh, like Brandon, uh, it, my father is the first uh, in mining. Um, he came to the Yukon, uh, really uh, adventurous, outdoorsy, and uh, and uh, despite having studied uh, biology in university, uh, took it upon himself to to learn rocks and uh, got talking to prospectors and uh, became one himself and and uh, launched out like that uh, full time. Um, and uh, yeah, on, on the other side of my family, uh, my mom did uh, well surveying at, at McMillan Pass and a whole bunch of different jobs, uh, working with the software company, working with uh, the Yukon government. And I think uh, uh, it was also a key part, obviously, of my, of my upbringing. And I think brought more than just kind of the, the prospector's grit and resolve to, uh, you know, to the approach uh, to things. So definitely uh, kind of benefit from, from both sides of the coin. And so maybe I'll ask you, you know, so you both are in this, sort of the same boat where you're, you know, you're second generation Yukon or second generation mining family yourselves, right? And so, I mean, you know, growing up, and this is, again, like I say, kind of a, a reflective sort of exercise, but, you know, you know, talk around the dinner table sort of style things right here. What was what was normal to you growing up in a mining family that maybe looking back you think would be unique to someone growing up in your own setting like that? And Scott, I'll let you take this one first. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think I had a pretty unique upbringing uh, and not just being, you know, from the Yukon, but even within that context. Um, uh, it's a, yeah, prospecting is not necessarily the most uh, lucrative uh, in profession at all times. And, um, and so, yeah, it was really kind of a, a, a distinct lifestyle choice too. Um, and, uh, and so it was, int- you know, I, I grew up in a, a small cabin, um, single room, no power or running water, you know, we we're chopping through the ice to, uh, to get a bucket of water and then bring it home, uh, to the, to the big bucket, uh, all winter long and all summer long too, for that matter. And so, uh, yeah, you know, falling asleep to the sound of, uh, kerosene lanterns going out and, you know, I have very visceral memories of, of those uh, sounds and smells and probably highly romanticized. I'm sure it was very stressful for my father trying to make ends meet with, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, the, the, inconsistent income from prospecting but uh but it was really a neat way to grow up and at the same time in the summer times we would go out and, and spend long stretches of times in, in pretty remote wilderness back when uh you know we didn't have gps we didn't have sat phones and we just get dropped off you know you just look for a lake that's big enough to land a float plane that's kind of near where you want to go prospecting and and you get dropped off there with a whole bunch of supplies you set up a base camp and then you know, the plane's going to come back in three weeks on a certain date. And so on that date, you're just sitting there at the lake, just kind of listening for a plane. And um, I was amazed when I was little at how good my dad was at listening for planes. He was quite having bad hearing. He would hear it, you know, like a full two minutes before anyone else, but very reliably. And I I think I've developed a little bit of that, but I don't think I've spent quite as many uh, afternoons and, and long days sitting at lakes waiting for a plane as he has. So, Quite the skill, eh? And Brandon, what about you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting the the sound of planes. Allegedly, I've I have lost this talent, but allegedly, as a small child, three or four years old, I could tell what type of plane it was by sound, because we, you know, we're so often um, in camp, even as a child, that you'd learn like, oh, that's the beaver, or that's the otter, or you know, it's something like that, and um, and that's probably one of the differences when you're raised in a, a family like this, is that. Um, even as a young child, you're involved, right? I was in, you know, exploration camps very, very early, right? And, and some of my first memories are in these camps and, and um, you're not productive, (laughs) right? At that age, needless to say, Um, but you're there and that's, you know, so you're in a household where sometimes your, your parents are away or you're certainly your father is away for an extended period of time on a trip or sometimes you're going, away with them right and and so it gives you a different view of their occupation than if they have a standard you know if your if your parent does a standard office job or or warehouse job or something like that other than maybe an occasional take your kid to work day you tend not to get much exposure to it but i think when you're involved in a family that does grassroots level exploration and, and these field camps at least you used to, it's harder nowadays to get away with having someone under 18 in a camp. And I understand, you know, why, you know, the safety rules are are how they are, but it feels like a bit of a missed opportunity because so many of us had that exposure um, when we were young. I mean, I had my first, I like to joke, I had my first on the job discipline at three years old because I woke up in the middle of the night to leave the camp or leave our tent uh, to poop right outside the front of the tent because it was too cold to to get to the outhouse, so I just you know quickly <laughs> drop drop trow and powered it out and went back to my sleep. <laughs> my dad was not terribly impressed when he found that in the morning. <laughs> so it's it's I, it's different, right? I did not you know, I did not grow up in a log cabin. I was allegedly conceived in a log cabin. I did not I did not uh, grow up in a log cabin. We we had a um, a house in um, Ross River. It's still there. Um, that was built by the prospector Al Kulan, who discovered um, the Faro when that became the Faro mine. Um, and it was a carbon copy of their house in West Van because he wanted his family to spend more time in Ross River. So he built the exact same house there, which is the kind of eccentricity you expect from people in this industry. Uh, so it's still there. It's owned by the government now. Um, but um, it's. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a different lifestyle than than a standard go to school. You know, just your your parent what your parents do is mysterious, right? Like you don't really know. Like it's, I think it's very valuable for kids. 
Well, I'm already going to go off script here, guys. So I hope that doesn't, you know, kind of get you get you nervous. But I think that the the comments you both made, and Scott, particularly you, but I think Brandon, there's daylight here for you to answer this too. But I mean that you know, Scott, you talk about I mean a single room log cabin. I mean that, that's classic, you know, Yukon Canadiana history, and you know the hiss of the kerosene lamp. I mean, and now you're the CEO of a, I mean, almost a billion dollar company. I mean, is there are there perspectives or or lessons that you still bring with you that, or you know, is there is there an approach to how you live your life even that, that you kind of carry with you from those things that help maintain perspective for you? Um, yeah, well, I think first I should clarify that it wasn't a log cabin. I don't want to overly romanticize it. It was, <laughs> you know, timber frame, um, uh, shack basically, but, uh, yeah, nice little place. Um, and, but I think, and maybe to get your question, maybe some of it is that romanticization even that I have for that time that has led to sort of a, uh, a willingness to take on risk because I see, you know, failure as, okay, if, if I have to fall back on things like worst case scenario, go and, and live like that. And, you know, you can get by on a pretty tight budget. And, uh, and I mean, I had, uh, I have only fond memories of my childhood uh, and in, in that sense. And um, yeah. And so, you know, uh, I, I think that, like I said earlier, it would be, a lot harder being the adult in that situation versus being the, the child in that situation. But uh, nonetheless, that misunderstanding anyway has led me to to jump in and, and take on risks that I otherwise might not have. And I think Brandon's point on, on just having a different perspective uh, shown to you as a child also helps where you kind of, you, you don't just see, yeah, the cookie cutter that you go in and this is what work is and, and you do it for these hours and then you've done your work and you can be, you know, X, Y, or Z in terms of your your profession, but kind of getting a, a better sense of like right from the start of just kind of how you might go about building a business and how you, uh, you know, how you generate revenue from nothing and, and, uh, and, you know, how you work through the discovery process and, you know, industry specific things, but also just general uh, looking at how the the modern world works. I think when you get that outsider's perspective, you uh, you see some things that you might not get if you're just kind of uh, going into the I don't know the machine of you know go to college, go to get your job from there, and uh, and retire at, at X, and you know have your two and a half kids and so on. Hmm. Over to you, Brandon. Yeah, I, I think um, yeah, I, I remember those feast and famine. You know, the cyclicality of the industry as well, and I, and I think. Perhaps it gives you some confidence as now both Scott and I are parents that I can re recall the famine bits being more stressful, right, on my parents. But I, I don't, it didn't feel less happy as a kid, right? Um, so, you know, it's it's perhaps a lesson for parents that, um, you know, your, your, your kids, if, if you're going through a tough time, you know, if you're not, you know, projecting that stress onto them too much, um, they're still going to be happy, right? And and you know, those risks are are can be okay. Um, you know, I think that learning as well that um, I, I think a big lesson that that you take as a kid, particularly when you're in field camps or even as an adolescent, um, is that you know, particularly the old days, a little different now. But when you got dropped off for a week or ten days, and and you may have had like those radios where you had to like connect and have, make the operator dial the phone number for you um scott if you had line of sight you know to a to a repeater um but there's a huge amount of self-reliance right if something goes wrong you can't just be like well this thing's gone wrong i better call someone to fix it it's like no you fix it if you're not familiar with how to fix that thing you better start figuring it out and this is before you know internet and you know no starlink so you're not looking things up so i think being in those styles of camps where um, everyone chips in and, and you have to solve problems together. Like I think this industry weeds out people who are uncomfortable with uncertainty and can't become comfortable with, with certain uncertainty. Because you know, as we can tell you, running a drill program, you plan it, and then the actual drill program happens and it's radically different and things always go wrong. Every drill program, something goes wrong. Um, and you pivot and adapt and, and fix and what have you. And so I think early on getting exposed to that is, is really, really valuable. You know, we, we risk sort of coddling our, uh, you know, children or e even junior employees and not exposing them to 
kind of a a manageable chaos which i think builds you know great you know managers and and people right i find it immediately interesting how you guys you know you're talking about rural very rural yukon origins and you can still kind of universalize that into into you know lived experiences and lessons for people that have no idea what it's like up there right so that's quite interesting why don't i ask this one and brown i'll let you take this one away first you know i think it's actually a decent segue based on what the conversation where we're at right now was your future career right now obvious right i mean kind of how i have it phrased were you born with a rock pick and a hand lens in hand, or you know, did you rebel against the family trade before, and then make your way back to it, or or how did that kind of come? How did that come about? No, you know, it was interesting. I I um, had an aptitude for science, right? So sciences, right? You know, I was strong in math and physics and chemistry and and that sort of stuff through high school, and um, it seemed like that was the path was going to be a science. You know, I flirted with potentially doing medicine and in fact um did starting off in first and second year was more of a combined chemistry biochemistry which i was thinking about research or or medicine um but i was still doing all my summer work through my father and exploration um and it actually took uh geez it was it was an organic chemistry lab or inorganic chemistry lab where my neighbor three times one time she got mercury on me the next time she spilled concentrated nitric acid on me. And then the third time there was like a plug in her, you know, like this, um, the pressure system. So it was like building up this expanding tube where there's gonna explode and shatter glass everywhere. And I had to fix that as well. And I just realized, I don't wanna be in a lab. Like this is like, <laughs> like it seems to me like the field is is like no, no more dangerous and a hell of a lot more fun. <laughs> so at the end of my second year, halfway through my second year, I, I took geology 100 and then pivoted to geology. Um, I think I think my dad was happy. I think my mother was freaking out because she saw the cyclicality that you know my father had had lived through. Um, but it's it's worked out okay. It was, certainly was never, you know, never preordained. I, I really struggled to understand what I should do with myself through through most of my youth. And so maybe there's a quick follow up and then I'll hand it over to Scott Brandon. But was there a moment you said second year geo, but was there a moment you can look back on where you just know that's it? That's the moment where it was crystallized or clarified for you finally? Um, yeah, I, I think I took, you know, I was uncertain at the end of the second year. Uh, I was wrapping up, you know, second year chemistry and, and biochem and, and biology courses. Um, and I took this geology 100 course just kind of on a lark because I just didn't, I just, this didn't feel like what I wanted to do. Uh, I didn't feel like I wanted to be in the lab. And um, honestly, medicine is extremely tough to get into. And I did not have the work ethic for it at that point in time. I developed my work ethic uh, maybe a little later than some. Uh, you know, uh, we boys mature a little slower. Um, so I really took till. Uh, every year in university, I had better grades than the year before, and I, including almost flunking out first year, despite being on full scholarship. So it was, I just really felt lost. Um, I was thinking about dropping out because it was the dot com boom, and I was like, oh, I mean, I like you know, go do something and that, and uh, took a geology course, and uh, we just had a lot of fun with it. And I was thinking about that and, and the fun I'd had working, you know, up uh, up near Finlayson Lake uh, in Yukon um the summer of four and i was like yeah maybe i'll do this and so i did that and registered for for second year geology courses for the year after and, and the rest is history hmm. so that kind of platonic ideal of university being that area where you actually can figure out what you want to be worked out for you eh? um, yeah well I, there's I, look i have a lot of thoughts on that maybe the canadian system sets up people who are a little bit directionless to fail right so hmm. I, I would i would have benefited from a gap year which is which is common in australia and the UK and stuff like that. But in Canada, you take a gap year, you lose all your scholarships, right? So so that rushed me into university really without any direction. Hmm. Fair point. Scott, yourself, what, what you, so was it always obvious you were gonna, that you could follow your father's footsteps or what were your ideas on that? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that it was. I think he, um, well, actively encouraging, you know, my participation on prospecting trips and, and so on. Uh, at least, you know, verbally discouraged me from uh, from going into the industry just because it is so uh, uncertain and um, and it's you know it's a it's 
takes a, a, a certain type of individual, I think, to uh, to come into the industry in the first place. But I can I can definitely identify with a lot of what uh, Brandon was saying there. And uh, for me, I had this burning passion, like millions of other children, to uh, to go to space and to become an astronaut. And uh, you know, I did well enough in high school that it wasn't like that uh, was necessarily extinguished too early. And uh, you know, uh, was was pushing hard on, on a bunch of different fronts. Got a pilot's license. Uh, did uh, yeah, and was kind of going down that path. And I started out in, in aerospace engineering, um, and did uh, did two years of that. Um, and uh, I'd also uh, well, actually, I, I had the uh, uh, I guess in this context, it's a benefit, but I didn't have uh, scholarships, or at least not a um, you know not a full ticket sort of a thing. And so I was free to take a gap year uh, and go further into debt. And um, <laughs> uh, and I, and I did that, and uh, I'd like to say it was some transformative experience and, and that sort of a thing. But actually, when I came back, I think when I left, I was thinking, you know, I, I'm going to switch to something else. I'd taken an introductory geology course, and, um, and it just so happened that the professor was, uh, you know, a very sharp guy, uh, but like uh, uh, he ended up leading the uh, the Curiosity rover, the science team. Uh, his name's John Grotzinger. Uh, and, and we connected because he'd done some of his graduate work in the Yukon and I'd spent, you know, uh, my childhood out there prospecting in some of the same rocks. And um, and so, you know, that definitely got me uh, thinking about geology more seriously. And uh, but when I came back from my gap year, I was like, no, no, I'll finish this. And I did one week of aerospace and I was like, ah. and that's when all the pieces kind of reality kind of came back to roost. And, um, and I quickly looked up what I needed to do the geology degree and with the rationale, maybe there's a bit of laziness there because the aerospace was super demanding uh, compared to geology, but the geology program was was fantastic and, and, and took a lot too. Um, and uh, and I saw that I was able to kind of condense it into like if I really worked at it, could do it in, in two years. And so I did that, and, but it was still with that space focus. Like uh, my thesis was on a, a rare type of uh, very primitive meteorite. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with a, a really sharp scientist there as well. Um, and, uh, and ultimately when I got my first job out of school, uh, it was at an exploration camp in the Yukon, uh, but it was, uh, you know, I, I basically just had to read what a mineral deposit was because I'd been so focused on uh, mm -hmm. all these sciences as they apply to planetary formation and, and everything like that. And it's still relevant. I mean, it's still, you know, it's still physics, it's still chemistry and, uh, and that sort of a thing, but uh, pretty much had to start from scratch and, and start learning about various deposit models and that sort of thing just from uh, getting out there. But, uh, but even then, I, I think that, uh, you know, there was some, uh, yeah, I probably didn't know it until we hit hole seven with snow line. I was like, okay, this, this makes sense. This is a good thing to be doing. But uh, yeah, I mean, part of it's been just having this, having these projects that I've worked on uh, with my father for so long and not wanting to see them die and, and just trying to push them ahead a little bit of, of golden handcuffs. But now, you know, I've built this, uh, this huge foundation of experience through a, a lifetime in the industry and, uh, and doing different roles in the industry and, and so on. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense for me to be here. Interesting how hindsight provides clarity. I mean, both of you gentlemen are talking about how you almost kind of backed into this job, not backed into, but had to close other doors before you went through this door, right? And now it seems, now we can, from this perspective, say it's such a natural fit for both of you, but it took that sort of, yeah, that formative, transformative experience in your early 20s to understand what didn't work for you before you kind of headed back to, to old territory, right? Uh, just a comment from Nate here for you, uh, Snowline there, Scott. He says, my seven-year-old holds Snowline in his RESP and he's thanking you for the fact he's got a free ride through university now. So there's the, there you go. We'll, we'll see. Maybe by the time the seven, seven turns into 17, we'll have a triple the price here of university. We'll see what we get. Well, good luck anyway. Congratulations there. Um, maybe natural follow-up. I mean, what, so what degrees do you hold? I mean, I think this is such an interesting question that maybe is simple, but because it is such a niche industry and it requires a very specific set of knowledges and skills, but still I find that sometimes the backgrounds, you know, I think you guys kind of touch on this. You don't necessarily have to start there to end there. Do you guys just want to touch on maybe the, what degrees you guys hold? And then I'll have a more in-depth question to, to follow that up with after. Yeah, I uh, guess I'll, I'll start. Yeah, sorry, Brendan, yeah sure. it was the, the Bachelor of Science in Geology from UBC. Um, then, I, you know, like the, it's him an MBA after that, but, but it got um, a little weird in the middle because, um, you know, in 2000, when I graduated, um, was a very, very tough time for, you know, geology grads. Very, very, very tough. I think like three of us 
maybe got got work and um you know so i was i was trying to do that on the side but i was contracting um that was the tail end of the dot-com boom so i did catch it a little bit so i was i was doing some programming that ended up being a five-year break from geology doing programming and and it weirdly i my, my last gig for three years was kind of uh building the, the trading system, the back end of a trading system for sports betting, <laughs> which I think has actually gave me a tremendous insight to uh, the psychology of people who invest in junior mining. Um, but um, I, I didn't, again, that was like, I accidentally ended up there and, and you know, it's so you're, you're putting your head down, you're doing this. And one day you kind of wake up and like, what am I doing? Like, this was not what I studied. This is not what I wanted to do. So I was trying to think of a way, you know, how do I do something different? How do you know? I wasn't even thinking it's like getting back into mining. Um, but I um, uh, applied for a few different uh, uh, MBA programs um, while I was living in England and, and got accepted at Oxford and decided to study there. Um, so that, and then I ended up, you know, out of there, really a bit of an accident. Um, again, did a this summer program with Macquarie Bank. Uh, really unrelated to to mining and metals, and well, it wasn't unrelated to mining, but unrelated to metals, um, and got hired into their metals team, right? So, so then I was back in the mining industry, right? So it's it's um, certainly what I would tell people, you know, is that success or is rarely linear, um, and it's um, you know very you know you don't know exactly. You can plan out what you want and then things actually happen like the drill program right and, and you have to be nimble and and have to know when to stay the course or when to make a quick pivot right so um could have all easily gone wrong for me um you know i think we get a lot of you get the people who do these sort of panels and and people listen to us there's a survivorship bias here as we're the ones who are not the smartest but the ones whose whose quick decisions whose pivots or or whatever ended up turning out good sometimes because we did the research and sometimes because we just got lucky right so uh, anyways that's that was a long-winded way of saying i did a geology undergrad and an mba <laughs> oh good thank you i appreciate chasing rabbits like that but scott what about you what's your formal academic background um yeah no i i did a geology undergrad as well uh obviously um sort of compressed at the end there as i as i mentioned so it's sort of an informal uh minor in engineering um and then, uh, yeah, I, I jumped right into the industry from that, but then I uh, did a quick uh, pivot a year later uh, and did a, a one year uh, tack on just a, a master's degree in, in science writing, which was, uh, I'd done a concentration in writing as an undergrad and uh, love writing. And, you know, I, at one point even considered that as a uh, something to push uh, towards. And, um, and yeah, so so went back. and just had that opportunity to do that, and uh, and that was great. But then this basically gold boom of 2010 broke out while I was doing that, and I was spending all my evenings uh, doing a bunch of remote geology work uh, and supporting field crews and that sort of thing before going back to to classes and to an internship and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, and then it was just just full out. Uh, I was actually looking at. I think I, I did get kind of caught on that machine, and I think that. Uh, I see it so much um, where people in their undergrad, you know, that you're surrounded by academia and you're surrounded by these professors who have done incredible things within academia and they're very bright people. And so that kind of just becomes the model. And I think out of my undergrad, like maybe a hundred percent minus, you know, excluding myself uh, went on to do PhDs. Like it was just like, that's what you do. And there's this kind of track set there. And I think I, I, I definitely would have done that if I hadn't been, uh, had a little bit of uncertainty just from my background and, um, and then, uh, and, you know, had some tough choices and yeah, and yeah, I had applied to a couple of PhD programs and was trying to decide which one to go to and, uh, and that kind of a thing. And I just got pulled away because of this exploration boom. And then suddenly it was, you know, I was several years out and, uh, before I even thought about going back to school again, um, I ended up going for a, uh, I want to do something totally different and uh, ended up uh, doing a, a degree at a, a new university that they just uh, built in Saudi Arabia called the uh, KAUST, University of Science and Technology. A uh, really incredible place, some very bright minds that they uh, poached for their faculty from around the world. And uh, yeah, really, it, it was a, a special uh, uh, experience. And, uh, and on the back of that, uh, I tacked on um, 
and, and this was, you know, this was the doldrums of 2014 and, and so on. And, um, and so there really wasn't much going on. I, I decided to go back to school after a year of working just as hard as I did in, in 2010 and 2011, but without generating a cent of income. And it was kind of like, okay, what am I doing here? Um, so, you know, went back to school and at least got a small stipend as a grad student, um, at least uh, for the, the research related degree. And then, uh, and then like Brandon uh, went for an MBA uh, following that up. And so, uh, yeah, that was a, a great experience. And, um, you know, I, I think that, that I learned that very quickly in going full out in uh, as a prospector that, uh, you know, you've got to know the business end of things. You, you go and find something that's just the first step and then the rest of it's uh, is business. And so the MBA made a whole lot of sense. I, you know, I didn't necessarily have this trajectory in mind at the time, but I just wanted a better understanding of uh, where these projects are going and, and, you know, how you position them when you find them and that kind of a thing. Hmm. Interesting. And so I, I think that, Scott, you particularly kind of were t- was touching on this future and this next question here. You know, I think that, that, that you know, work experience versus academic experience, that, you know, that the, it's the combination of the two that provide for me, in my opinion, anyway, the, the sort of strongest sort of work. They work together and are most effective to get when they're together. And there are deficiencies in both when they're separate. Right. But I guess maybe if I'm going to ask you both and Scott, I'll let you lead this one off. You know, how would you compare that for you know, that the formal academic setting? advantages and disadvantages of both strengths or weaknesses, et cetera. And can you, com- and then comparing that to your more informal, you know, lived and work experience growing up and, and prior to your decision to return to, to that industry. I mean, how, how would you compare what you learned or didn't learn or had to learn, et cetera, et cetera, from, from each of those? Yeah. I, I mean, I think you, you make a really good point there in terms of uh, them both complementing the other and, um, and, you know, I, I guess you could go down either path exclusively. And certainly, you know, school is not a necessary prerequisite to uh, success in, in business, whether it's uh, whether it's in mining or any other industry. And you see, you know, some of the best examples are people who even dropped out of high school and, and uh, went on to, to form transformative companies that changed the world. Um, uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a lot you can learn at school. I mean, that's that's why it's there and, and it helps. And, you know, you can contribute a lot solely through those academic careers. I mean, uh, some of the greatest advancements we've made as a, as a species are coming from people who just put their head down and, you know, they're, they're just obsessed or very interested in some uh, problem, whether it's physics or geology or, uh, or philosophy and, and, you know, come up with these revelations that, uh, that are, you know, it move us forward. But anyway, to kind of bring it back into the realm of what's reasonable in a conversation on mining, um, yeah, I think that uh, both have been really helpful. And, you know, there were times uh, that my background, as I mentioned, kind of steered me away from that uh, purely academic track. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I would see projects uh, where, and that was one thing when I was when I was considering going for a PhD, some of the projects on the, on the table just didn't really appeal to me that much. You know, when you just are just digging down into a problem that's, so specific to like, you know, one sort of client and you can't really see how it relates to the bigger picture. How does this advance the understanding besides just kind of being a, an academic question around this particular isotope or something like that, that, you know, it, it, that wasn't really getting my blood flowing and understanding the amount of work that you need to, uh, or at least having, uh, you know, some uh, idea of the amount of work that would go into a, a PhD like that, uh, you know, you really got to want it. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's kind of seeing the, the bigger picture and the excitement of what you can do with this knowledge uh, led me in the other direction. Um, and then, uh, but still having that, that background and, you know, pursuing a whole bunch of different, uh, a whole bunch of different topics and a whole bunch of different fields, I think has put me in a very uh, good position now that I'm in the industry. And, you know, I, I definitely fall back even on my writing, uh, you know, it was a, it was a scientific writing degree, like, uh, the kind of, uh, writing you'd see for general public consumption, where you're trying to, you go to talk to the scientist on one side and you go and write for the magazine on the other side. And so, uh, you know, as a as a uh, someone writing news releases and that kind of thing, that suddenly you know I, I didn't plan that, but it comes in handy. Um, cool. And uh, and so yeah, just uh, it, you know every thing that you pursue, I think, can find some kind of application. So I'm all for you know going out there, learning what you can, taking it in, and then going trying to find ways to apply it. And Brandon, over to you. That sort of advantages or disadvantages to both, or or lessons learned or unlearned, sort of thing from both. Yeah, look, I think the the intensity of of work um, can and generally is a lot higher than academia. And I'm not to say that academia is easy, right? But I mean the the, the you know the, there's the amount of t- there's the amount of time you have 
you know, an experience, but also the intensity of that experience. The, the challenge with the professional world is you probably have less control over what you're doing. Do you get the job you want? And is the job you want even what you think it was going to be, right? Like maybe you study mining engineering and you go work, you want to work for uh, tech at, at, you know, Red Dog or something like that. And you find that you spend five years doing the same repetitive minutia task and you don't learn a lot. Um, you learn something, but but you're not getting exposed to enough. Or you might find that you get, it's maybe not the ideal job, but actually you get thrown into a whole bunch of stuff and you're just like, it's like a fire hose of learning, right? It's not easy to predict how that works out in the professional world. The, the advantage of the academic world is, although there is still definitely uncertainty, is your supervisor or whatever, what you thought they were going to be, do they give you the support? Is your thesis leading to something that you, that you thought it would? But it is more predictable, right? So, so I think there's there's an advantage to each. I definitely think a strong educational foundation, um, at least your undergrad. You know, I, I certainly would not encourage people to, to drop out to get started, right? You're you're really the the people that succeed in that situation are the outliers of the outliers, and it's probably more to do with luck. I mean, certainly their abilities have to be there, right? But um, I think a strong ed educational foundation and whether you go into a master's or certainly whether you go into a PhD is increasingly questionable. I think Scott, you put it well, I think the, what's the expression of like, you know, as you get advance further and further into academia, because you're getting more specialized, you know, more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. Right? <laughs> um, I think is how the expression goes. Um, so I think that's, that's the challenge of picking between the two is it, it's, it's going to be a bit of uncertainty. I, I think the right job opportunity trumps a a, a normal education, um, but the wrong wrong job job opportunity can pretty quickly become a waste of your time. Right. Hmm. So we're going to switch gears here, guys. Thanks for those answers. I'm I'm having to start to call here a bit because uh, yeah, I mean the strong answers take time. But I, there's one that I'm, I'm going to insist that we answer this one because this is one that I uh, personally interested in and I, you'll see why in a second. But, you know, I'm, I'm a stubble jumper, Saskatchewan boy, prairie boy, and I've lived, you know, born in the 80s and I, through my life, I mean, my, I'm the second, I'm the first generation not born on the farm and I've seen this transition from, from agriculture to agribusiness, right? This sort of corporatization, industrialization of what was once a very intense family business. And then you can see the parallels I'm trying to draw here to you guys, right? And this kind of slow motion death of this through mass consolidation through, I mean, the, the economies of scale. And it makes, on, on a certain degree, it makes sense, right? There is logic to it, right? And so I guess the question I have, you know, I mean, you, you can probably infer from here, right, is how much, you know, that, that grizzled old prospector, right? I mean, you know, kissing the toes up in, in Dawson, right, from a guy who lost some kind of thing, uh, you know, how much is that disappearing? Has it been corporatized or industrialized? And, and is that lifestyle still viable? The world that you were born into from your fathers, right? Is that lifestyle viable long term? Or do you think it's falling prey to similar pressures as my agriculture to agribusiness sort of uh, approach? I guess, Brandon, I'll let you start off. I don't think exploration lends itself well to economies of scale. Um, I think the proof in this is that most majors do very little, sometimes no exploration. Right, they they generally rely on juniors as their their farm team, so to speak. Right, mm -hmm. um, I I think that you need to crack the nut on a project. You need someone who's passionate about that project, right? And and who it's their, you know, the the ticket to their success, right? And I think that um, it's tough to scale that up massively. Mm -hmm. Now, whether new technologies change that. I don't know, but I don't feel the junior business model and, and by extension, the prospecting business model is at risk of, of um, being sort of phased out or, or evolved out just yet. I, I do feel, still think we need those passionate people on the ground. And I, and I don't think that massive, you know, data sets from, you know, satellites or, or aerial surveys or regional surveys combined with AI or anything like that is, is going to radically change the way we do things. I, I'm open to being proven wrong, but, but I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's going to change. Scott, thoughts from you? Yeah, I think uh, those are some really good points, but I think that, um, I think that we are on a, on a pretty steep downward slope, not because of the, you know, the lack of, uh, business 
uh, sense for it or, or functionality of the role. Um, I agree with Brandon completely there, but I think that uh, just the level of regulation and so on that uh, the prospectors face now, I think that every year you see more and there are, you know, there are hurdles that can be overcome by uh, junior mining companies and then bigger mining companies and that kind of a thing, but they're being applied kind of across the board without necessarily recognition of, you know, the value of the prospector and the value that we get from that early stage work. And like Brennan says, you know, it's, it's difficult to replicate. Uh, you need people out there who are passionate about things who, uh, you know, who know that uh, you should walk up a creek instead of down a creek, that, you know, just little things. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think that we're, we're losing that, you know, when we, we come up and you see that uh, just, you know, across the corporate world, you see a government that comes in with a new policy because, you know, because they want to tax Apple, say, and then it, it catches all these other corporations in the dragnet who didn't mean to target, but, you know, it makes their life dis difficult at the, you know, at the extreme low end of that dragnet are prospectors. And, uh, and, you know, they're getting tossed around by all these things that aren't necessarily meant to apply to them uh, or they are, but they kind of misunderstand what the, uh, what the potential impacts are. And I think that, uh, you know, it's that's that's been a factor in the very low uh, levels of exploration that we've seen. Of course, the markets have been really tough. Uh, you know, as a prospector over the past decade, a big part of the reason Snowline exists is that we couldn't sell the projects. Um, and, you know, obviously they were pretty good projects. And so uh, so we had to start a company in order to buy these things. Um, and so so that, that weighs on it too. Um, and I think that those aren't completely uh, separate problems from each other, but, uh, but yeah, I think that that uh, what society as a whole, intentionally or not, is doing to the prospecting profession uh, is, is detrimental not just to our industry, but to, to society as a whole in terms of you know sourcing the resources that we need for for future generations. Hmm. That's interesting, and, right? Go if you had more thoughts there. Please finish it off. Oh no, sorry. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, in, informed governance requires it. It has to be informed to make informed decisions, right? And then those niche industries, like you see, I think, can get get lost. A baby with the bathwater sort of risk is what happens when you have broad sweeping legislative sort of evolutions that don't take into account niche industries like the prospector, right? I guess maybe maybe a follow up question that does make sense from here though is, and Scott, I apologize, I don't know your personal family life. I know Brandon does, but do you want your kids to work in this industry? I mean, do you you know do you want them? Yes, no. I mean, if, you know, hypothetical. Otherwise, Scott, maybe I'll just let you kind of. Um, yeah, I mean, I I'd like to think that uh, you know I would encourage my kids to to go down whatever whatever path they want to go down. Uh, you know, like I said, I wasn't really steered into this industry. Um, I just kind of found my way to it. Um, but uh, that said, my my oldest son is two, uh, and right now he wants to be an alligator. And so I do have some internal <laughs> there where I don't know if that's the most viable path. And so if he continues on that, it could get problematic later. But for now, just letting it slide. Yeah, it's off. Yeah, my four year old wants to be a villain, right? So uh, he's been watching too much Despicable Me. Um, keep asking me, sure you don't want to be here? He's like, no, villain. It uh, looks like a lot of fun to him, which, you know, depending on what part, you know, if you become a promoter, you can certainly be a villain, right? There's certainly aspects of our industry that a lot of people would qualify. I don't know if that's where I'd want them to end up, but um, I think, yeah, you know, I think a, a key thing is you hope that through success, you're able to empower your kids to do what they want to do. Um, if they're excited by what I'm doing and they want to get involved, and I'm actually... I uh, think in a month or so is is at my um, younger boy, the four year old's um, preschool. It's a duty day, so I'm doing the duty day. So I'll be there with him for the morning, and I'm presenting on mining, and I'm going to have rocks and stuff like that. And and you know that's the, there, there's one question there about how do we get this started? How how young is too young or too old is too old? And I want to talk to the mining about that age, right? And if some kids get passionate about it, that's great. If my kids want to do it. Yeah, that's great. And I, and I think that having a parent that's gone through that industry, even putting aside nepotism, right, um, which, you know, is, is my dad giving me a summer job nepotism? Yeah, I mean, I didn't get like, you know, I wasn't made VP or anything like that. I was, you know, digging soil samples. But, um, you know, you get you get additional access to experience. You get the counsel of your parents who understand, right? Like if if my kids wanted to be, uh, I don't know, um, you know, like Scott Aerospace Engineers or something like that, I'd be like, uh, okay, well, look, I have no clue about that industry or how to help you, right? Um, I have a general sense, right? But but I wouldn't have any specific 
advice for them, right? So, so it's, it, it can be nice when your parents can give you very specific advice because uh, that, that's one less mentor that you have to find. And I think mentors are essential in your industry. Mm-hmm. I guess I'll, I have to follow up. My my two year old son wants to be a bulldozer right now, so maybe he does have a mining career ahead of him. That's uh, yeah, there you there's, go. there's hope, right? So um, let's transition here, though. Let's start talking about maybe the Yukon in general, or Yukon in general. We got 15 minutes left here, so I'll try to be efficient. Uh, and so I think that you know a big part of mining, as you know, don't understand, is community buy in, right? And and so I guess maybe how much do you have? How much do you feel? that being local leaders, as you gentlemen are, helps with that, right? I mean, like I say, I've lived in the in Yukon a couple of times myself. We were talking before we got on air, right? And and uh, I understand just I have a sense rather than have how small and tight-knit and local that community can be, right? And so I guess how much does being there, how important is that in terms of getting buy-in from, from people that you speak to? And uh, Brandon, I'll let you start there. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that... Um... You know, we, we left Yukon when I was five, and although I was back frequently visiting and working and stuff like that, um, you know, I think that there's not like I have a huge contact. I mean, I do have a huge contact base there, but but not from my time living there as a child, right? So um, I don't think, I think if you have a bad plan uh, and are doing a bad job, I don't think being from Yukon is going to help you at all. Then just like, I, you know, but... It, it does give you a bit, um, at least in terms of reputation, it gives you a bit of a starting point, right? A bit, not not a lot, but a bit. I think far more valuable is, um, you know, when you've spent a lot of time somewhere working somewhere, uh, the, the the contact base and maybe the trust you might have with the community or the government, et cetera, right? And, and service providers, I, I think that goes a long way. Scott? Yeah, no, I think I'd agree with that. Um, and, you know, it's it's certainly a, a bit of an advantage, and it can be, uh, and it can be pressed to to make it more of an advantage. Um, you know, like Brennan says, if you, you could have a local CEO who's not, uh, you know, not talking to the right people, not going to the communities, not doing the things that uh, he or she needs to do, and and not getting that advantage versus someone who's in the case of the Yukon just flying up from Vancouver every couple of weeks and, and putting in that face time, and so. Um, but there, yeah, you know, but part of the intrinsic advantage too is just the chance encounters, the familiarity, the long history, uh, even, you know, having run, uh, uh, like staking and soils crews and stuff like that, you know, it's not too much for me to, to pick up the phone and, and talk to people and see if they, uh, you know, want to, want to come out and, and know that they're good people and, and that sort of a thing. And so, um, so yeah, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of little advantages, but it, it all depends on, uh, how you use them. I, I would sorry, just sorry to interrupt. I, w- I would say that you know I've kind of felt that my history in the community of Ross River and broadly my family's history there um, has not given me any sort of free pass or anything like that. In fact, I think it's elevated expectations. Um, but the, the counterbalance that elevated expectations is a more open dialogue, and I and I think that when everyone is able to speak their mind and and have uh, more truthful and open conversations as opposed to a little bit more standoffish and formal. Um, it's, you know, better. That's a better path to getting things done. Um, and I think when someone's, you know, if someone comes up there and they're from wherever, England or Australia or South Africa or some other mining country, and they maybe don't know the lay of the land, you, you might see that the, the community is perhaps a little more unsure about how to handle that in a relationship. And so I think I might actually, this is almost just asking the same question, but kind of on the, on the other side of the coin, how much do you, how much does it resonate with you that you, you know, you've, you're, you've got Yukon blood and you're now on a Yukon project, right? If you want to call it local pride or, or just that kind of buying into to that, that building and investing proverbially and literally right in, in Yukon yourself. I mean, I guess how community minded are you? And then I guess maybe to, to try to, drive home what my question is here. If you were leading a, a project in Timmins or in the Andes, would you be approaching it differently, even on an emotional level? And uh, Brandon, I'll let you take that one first. Well, you hope, you, you know, you'd hope that you'd have the same duty of care, um, regardless of where you are. And I'd like to think I, I would, you know, this is my first time in the big chair, so to speak. So I can only really talk about how I treat these projects as a CEO when it's a project in, you know, 
the backyard of what used to be my hometown. Um, but I, I think, you know, I, I do feel a very strong duty of care to that community. Um, and both in terms of making sure I don't screw things up, but also, you know, I think this project could be transformative in terms of, of benefits and, and positive impact. Um, so I take that extremely seriously and, and it would be unconscionable to me to to screw it up in terms of leaving a mess or something like that, right? That that's not I wouldn't do that anywhere, but but th never more would I not do it than, <laughs> than you know, like in the in the backyard of my my old hometown, right? So it's I think it definitely changes it, right? Now you have to um balance as CEO that you maybe don't overcompensate to that effect, right? And and you know it's it's these are your partners, but also your counterparties, right? So you, you have to not surrender uh, all your negotiating leverage if there's a negotiation um, because of an emotional attachment as well, right? So I, I think there's, you know, you have, you have to manage that and you have to be, you know, not dispassionate, but, but you know, cognizant of where your biases lie. Hmm. Well said. Scott, what about you? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I, I live in the Yukon by choice and uh, uh, explore here kind of through circumstance. Um, yeah, so I have a very strong uh, connection to the territory, um, very strong sense of pride here. And, uh, and um, yeah, that, that leads to, similar, to a similar sentiment. Like, I, I don't think that uh, if I were exploring in, in Timmins or Peru that I would be doing things uh, particularly differently. But, uh, but when it is... Uh, you know, you're, you're living in the place that, uh, that you work and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's hard to escape that connection. And it, it, it leads to the same sentiments that, uh, you know, that Brandon's talking about where, uh, yeah, really be unconscionable to, uh, to intentionally go about things the wrong way. And it really gives the incentive to, uh, you know, you see, you see problems that, uh, that, could be solved through uh, economic resilience and and uh, through primary production coming from the territory, and you see that benefit. You see at the same time you see you know this incredible wilderness with with thirty thousand people in it, that are almost the size of France, and uh, and you know that's a that itself is a pretty special asset this day and age. Um, hmm. And so uh, yeah, you I, I think you get just a really uh, thorough sense of, of what's there, and uh, and it ultimately makes me want to. Uh, press harder because it, you you know you could uh, I think push too hard if you're just considering the first side of that coin and and pull back too much if you're uh, pushing or if you're just looking at the second side of that coin. But I think there's a, a balance there, and, and living here certainly gives me the motivation to want to push and find that balance to the benefit of, of really uh, essentially everybody in the territory. Hmm. No, well said. And this this next question almost feels like a, a logical extension or, or conclusion of the previous question, just in terms of this is almost kind of tiptoeing into a more traditional sort of conversation around, you know, jurisdictional advantages or disadvantages of individual projects, but relationships with, with local First Nations, right? So I guess I would ask you to reflect on your own history. Do you see, and this is maybe a twofold question here, I'm trying to be cognizant of the time myself, but do you see changes from your youth to now, like I can say, part part A is in terms of how First Nations are approached in terms of duty to consult, and then part B is the actual approach of First Nations themselves to mining. Uh, do you, do you see an evolution in your own life in your own life cycle and your own lifespan from that? And Scott, I'll let you go first. Uh, definitely, um, although you know, with the caveat that I can't say I was super tuned in on on First Nations issues when I was four years old, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, uh, there there has been a sea change. At, I mean, actually, my, my father, uh, in you know, in some of the odd jobs in supplementing a prospecting career, uh, worked with the Tonquin John Council in the uh, in the territory and, and learned a lot that way. Worked, uh, you know, uh, alongside at least in a physical sense, not hierarchical, but uh, with Elijah Smith uh, when you know the Yukon was uh, doing a lot of things uh, in in terms of its uh, land claims agreements and that sort of a thing. And so, uh, definitely some level of familiarity with there, but. Uh, uh, really, the uh, Yukon First Nations, and, and really across the uh, across the country, I think are uh, growing into roles as uh, you know, not just a not a box to tick, but really uh, a very important voice uh, in the conversation. Um, you know, as, as as gatekeepers and guardians, and 
Um, and yeah, you know, I see a, a genuine and uh, uh, concern for uh, potential effects of industrial development on, uh, you know, traditional land uses. Uh, but at the same time, see, uh, a, there's a there's a history of benefits that have come through that too, and, and a growing recognition that um, that economic uh, independence or economic resilience is a key foundation. Uh, in terms of actually building uh, towards something like reconciliation, like you know, if you're just, uh, yeah, and so that, so that's really uh, been, I think, bubbling below the surface, and and, and seeing that awareness grow is uh, is really interesting. Um, where you know, I think that's where the the ticket to kind of true self government governance, uh, uh, greater opportunities, and uh, ultimately uh, greater uh, community well being opportunities for uh, and just a stronger uh, base from which to do land guardianship comes from a stable economy. And I'm seeing that recognition. I'm seeing a push uh, into development corporations who want to uh, own or be involved with primary productive assets, things like energy, things like mining. And so I think that's a, a huge step uh, in, in the right direction for, uh, for the North as a whole or Canada as a whole. Excellent. And Braden, uh, an evolution in terms of that attitude to and from mining and First Nations? Yeah, no, I, I think absolutely. I, I Like Scott, you know, I, I didn't have a strong sense of it when I was young and even as a teenager working in the industry. We, we always had First Nations working with us, um, and that always seemed um, unexceptional or, or the norm, right? Um, but there's definitely been through through both legal and and cultural changes um, a high velocity of change in expectations, and I would probably say the last twelve to fifteen years, um, the gradual change before that. But but it's really taken off since then. I think it was overdue, and I think that before I would say I, I described it as that maybe before there was an uneasy equilibrium and wasn't a fair equilibrium because I don't think the rights and, and um, um, title of, of indigenous groups were respected, um, but it was an equilibrium because they understood they had very little power right, um, to, to stop things they didn't like. You know, now it's changing and I think there's maybe not an equilibrium right now. Um, that doesn't mean that things are not possible, but this is in, in every jurisdiction with every different nation in, in Canada is going to reach that equilibrium at a different, you know, at a different point in time. Um, but I, I think there's there's great progress there. You know, I, I think that, you know, when I was exploring in the Casca territory with my father in the '90s, uh, Farrell was still running. Um, Wolverine had not yet been built, and and I think um, uh, Ketza was being built uh, shortly thereafter. That so, and those are three operations that failed. Um, in the subsequent decade or two decades and um, uh, you know Farrow left behind probably the biggest mine cleanup in Canada which I'm gathering is going to be multi billions of dollars so you might see how their perception of mining has changed that's all in one traditional territory and we had a very interesting meeting with the lands office of one of the Casca First Nations and, and they said look, look um, I don't want to ever be accused of talking in bad faith because we've had five mining operations in our traditional territory and four have failed and left behind messes. <laughs> so despite whatever you can say, whatever you want, but our perception is that you're an 80% likely to leave behind a mess. <laughs> if, you know, if you, you know, permit and build this operation. So it's their lived experience. And then we can say the regulations have changed. We're operating differently now. You know, Pharaoh was built at a time when Whitehorse was dumping garbage into the river as a means of getting rid of garbage, right? So there's a different time, but but we still have to manage those those lived real experiences, right? The, the massive mess left behind and the legacy and what that means for us. Um, so it's, it's a, a big change, right? I, I think companies that um, have some empathy for, for what they've experienced there, um, some empathy for the tangential stuff to our industry um, that, that sometimes that what comes with that, that economic opportunity is, is mostly good, but it's not all good. Right. Um, and it can be disruptive and people can be comfortable with the way things are. 
So I think you, you come at it with that sort of mindset and appreciate that you have to operate differently and you have to be at the bleeding edge um, and you have to have those open dialogues. I think you can get stuff done. Yeah, excellent. Well, well done. When I think I, I don't want to cut it short because I think I mean, this is just a strong conversation. Like I said from the start, I was looking forward to this one. Intelligent and, and, and honest answers from both of you. I appreciate that and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. But I think we should probably call here on the hour and we can pretend like we were actually on time for this. And so, yeah, Brandon, Fireweed, and, and uh, Scott from Snowland, thank you guys both. And I and appreciated your time and your answers. And we'll talk again home soon, hopefully.